Have you ever seen injustice in the world and thought, why doesn't God do something about it? Why couldn't God saw that, that I needed to update and, and said it? No, not right now. We're going to wait on that. But that's not where we are. And that's what, how, how this world works. Um, but really, we wonder when this, we see things that are, that are not right. It's not good. And we think, why would a good, merciful, good God, loving God, let such a thing happen? Have you ever asked that? I, I ask it. I'm a believer. I'm, I'm a pastor. I'm supposed to be like the best believer, and I'm not always. Um, but I think that too. Like, why, God? Why can't you intervene? Why can't you do the thing that I think you should do? Why can't you fix it in the way that I think it should be fixed? Why are there natural disasters, pandemic disease, genocide, or tyranny? And those are the big ones. What about the little things that we see in our own communities, culturally, people being abused and hurt? And why? why? I wonder why, why people get away with mistreating, this is a big one, why people get away with mistreating and abusing children. That's the most innocent of all. I know, I, he feels me. Um, he's like, yeah, don't let that happen. Um, he's, why does that happen? Why do, why do we let this kind of thing happen? Especially, like Hannah was saying, working with the foster uh, closet. Uh, you, not that the families that have them there are doing, but they, you know they came from something bad. So bad that the government had to step in, which they really don't want anything to do with it. They tried to like, it's like, ah, can you figure it out, right? And then they had to get involved. Something so bad that they had to take the children away. And then you're sitting there wondering, why did these kids, these cute, innocent children, deserve what they got? We think about these things. Sometimes the most innocent get the worst treatment. And if God is all-powerful and all-good, why doesn't he do something about it? And why doesn't he do it now? We all struggle with this. This might be why many people have a difficult time believing in God, and I know that for a fact, because many times a di discussion has come up, and they're like, I just can't. I don't know. If God is so good, why does he let this stuff happen? I just can't believe he's God. And if he, if he is God, I don't want to believe in him because bad things happen. They have a very short view on what God is and what all this is all about. It's why others walk away or reevaluate their faith, and maybe that's you. So we are in week four of our collection, Travel Light, and I hope it's been helpful for you guys. We're attempting to answer the question, what must a person believe to be a faithful follower of Jesus? What is the bare minimum? What is the deal breaker? What is the can't do without? What is essential? What is vital to the Christian faith? Like, if you took this away, you're not a Christian anymore. There's all sorts of things and rules we follow, and we're all getting confused because we all come together, and we have come from different backgrounds and religions. And they're like, wait, you don't do that? I thought that was required, right? You have those discussions with one another. They're like, wait a minute. They made it seem like I had to do that. And we sit there, and we evaluate what's culturally traditional that we might need to do away with or might not be meeting that need anymore, or maybe has been misconstrued and as seen as an absolute when it's really not. So our travel light list so far is, number one, that Jesus is God's son and our king. If you cannot get on board with Jesus is God and our king, none of this is going to work. You end up in some manipulated and manufactured version, right, which is not really God. You end up creating a copy that you like better. And you think that you're serving. I, I, this, this is one thing that breaks my heart. I, I, I hope it's not true. But in the evidence of the things that I can see and how people act and the way we treat church, especially in America, I feel like there is a large sum of people out there that think they are following Jesus, but they're not. They're following an idea, a better version, a more likable version to humans. And that is not Jesus. And it's one of those reasons that when they die, and these, the, the nightmare that we all probably have gone through is that we, we die and we get to heaven and Jesus says, I never knew you. And like, well, no, I, 
I went to church and I did the things and I said, and they said that was you. And he's like, that, that wasn't me. It's terrifying. Number two was Jesus came to illustrate and demonstrate what God is like. We want to know what God is like. What did Jesus do? That's God. And then last week, number three, Jesus defines sin as anything that harms you or others. That really changes the perspective on sin, doesn't it? Anything that harms you or others. And my friend, Pastor Josh, came and, from what I heard, did a dynamite job, right? And y'all, and y'all did really good. Y'all have not been sinning all week. I'm so proud of you guys. <laughs> so proud. Or you've just hadn't done anything because all you've done is sin. Um, <laughs> Jesus was very specific about sin. It's anything that harms you or harms the people around you. So today, I am blessed, guys, so blessed, to speak on the topic of judgment. (laughs) Everybody's favorite topic. Everybody loves judgment, right? Love to hear about it. love Love to get involved with it. But back to the initial question, why doesn't God do something about fill in the blank? Why doesn't he do something? This question reveals a universal, innate desire for judgment or justice. If you're saying, why doesn't God do something? That means you're wanting God to make a judgment. You're wanting him to serve justice. You can't have justice without judgment. It's just how it goes. They're one, they're one in, in the other. They're in the same basket, two peas in a pod. You can't have one without the other. And groups of people are powerfully united around things they believe that are not right. We've witnessed throughout history, witnessed it in recent history, that people are gathered over something that's not right. It is way easier to get people amped up into moving over something they don't want rather than something they do want right? And so we've seen this happen. We've seen people rallied around an ideal and an idea, and they get so worked up that they get violent, they get aggressive, they begin to do things. There there are right now on campuses in college, if you don't know, check the news, it's happening, right? In Texas, there are, are protesting. I'm not saying what they're protesting about. It doesn't really matter, but students on a campus they don't really have any problems. I know they feel like they have problems. And I remember when being in college and thought I had problems. And I realized I don't have problems as I became an adult. I wish I could go back to the problems of college. But a lot, life is a lot easier then, okay? But they are gathering and foregoing and, and disrupting their education to fight for something for somebody that's on the other side of the world that they really don't know anything about, and they only get information from TikTok and Instagram and that. And so then they are rallied together. I'm not saying they're wrong or they're right. The fact is, they have no idea what's happening on the other side of the world. But they're rallied enough to stand up together and do something about it. It's much easier to get people to rally over something that's not right. Wars, political ideas, money, personal injustice, often for better or worse. Hopefully, hopefully not finding yourself on the wrong side of history. Because we've seen that in the past couple years. Some people regret their decisions because they have now found themselves on the wrong side of history. Again, it's easier to rally people against things. But where does that come from, and why do we care? To know something is not right is to assume a standard for what is right. How do we even know that something is not right? There's an ideal out there. There is a reason why. There is something that we measure it up against, and we decide, that's not right. And I need to stand up, or somebody needs to stand up and do something about it. It all points to an ideal. Whether we agree or disagree with the ideal behavior, logical deduction reveals that there is an existence of an ideal. Because if I take you individually, I take you outside, and we view something, and we do some people watching. It's one of my favorite things to do. Forget the birds. It's people watch. That's interesting. Because they're erratic. They're more erratic than birds. Birds are predictable. 
Humans are not, okay, because we are selfish and we, we, are, we get uncomfortable and we do weird things and, you know, it's fun to watch. So if I walked out and I said, was that right or wrong? You would say, well, that's wrong. Or you would say, that's right, because you have a preconceived notion of what an ideal is. I don't care what level of humanity you are in on, whether you have a bunch of money or you have no money, whether you've been abused or you've never been abused, or you have a family or you don't have a family, you have an idea, especially young people who look at young parents at a restaurant and they think, I could do that better. We need you to think that because that's how we keep making more babies. I could do it better, right? And he's like, well, I have a baby. And then you realize you're just as bad as everybody else. <laughs> it's a trick. And it still works to this day. Uh, so that logical deduction reveals that there is something. What we're doing is judging something for falling short of the ideal. We're judging it against a view of what the ideal is. Here's an example. If I told you today that I haven't bathed in a month, you would go, that's not ideal. <laughs> Ew, you should bathe. But do you realize in centuries in the past, people took yearly showers they wouldn't bathe for a whole year. Can you imagine that? That's not ideal anymore, but it was ideal then. I don't even know if this is true, but I've heard this information. I need to fact check it. But do you know why women carry flowers at weddings? Because they didn't take a shower for a year. And they would get married around May or June because that around May was the time in April they would take a, take a bath. And they would hope that that was the time they smelled the best. But if they didn't, they had roses to kind of mask the smell. Right? Does that ruin it for some of you? I'm sorry if it does. But that's history. <laughs> We're doomed to repeat it. Um, so we have an ideal. And the irony is this is related to the popular criticism of God, partic particularly the Old Testament God, the OTG, <laughs> Old Testament God. Some of you are like, should I have known that? It's not in the Bible. I just made it up. Uh, what Jesus illustrated and demonstrated seems at odds with OTG. Um, when God decides to intervene or deliver justice, we either question, we don't like it, we're like, I don't like the way he did that, or we question it. We want him to step in and do something until the step in and do something is in a way that we don't like. Then, then we question it, and we go like, should he have done that? As if we know any better or, any, or have any other wisdom more than he does. A good example of, that Bible, of a Bible story is the flood. It represents God's judgment, which seems harsh. I'm not arguing that. Seems harsh, but he did it. And we think, was there really not another good person in the world? Is that possible? Was, were they really that bad? Were they really that unredeemable that you just had to wipe it clean? Like it were an Etch-A-Sketch and just shook it. It's like, let's start over, right? How, is that the case, really? Could he have done it differently? We want God to do something until he does, <laughs> mainly when he does it to us. We love justice and judgment and all of that. We, we have TV shows that are not real, that have, are in the probably 30th season that are about this. And then we watch real ones. Now it's like, it's not enough anymore. Now we want to watch the docuseries on this mass murderer and get into the mind of a murderer, you know, figure it out. Um, and then we've like, ooh, I, I kind of identified with that. That's kind of scary, you know. Am I a murderer? You know, we do this because we're infatuated with it as long as we're on the winning side. If we're on the losing side of judgment, we don't like judgment anymore. And we make statements like, you can't judge me, only God can judge me, right? And we get that from Scripture, which that's taken totally out of context. <laughs> and I get why it's fun to say, because it essentially releases you from every human on earth being able to judge you for your actions. Because we don't like to be judged. Because judgment means, I'm not doing it right. I don't measure up to the ideal. And that doesn't feel good. It doesn't. So we think about... When we want to judge, but we want it to go our way, and at the bare minimum, we want it against other people, that judgment. The third story in the Old Testament, the collection of stories at the front of the Bible, if you didn't know, 
deals with judgment and the things that don't seem right. So Genesis 1 and 2 is a count of creation. And just so you know, it doesn't matter. I, I know and this is going to be, I, someone might attack me for this. I don't know. Whether he made it in six literal days or it was six days and it was like a, a thousand years in, in that day and that's how they define it. It doesn't matter. God made it. That's what it matters. That is why we have that. It's giving credit where credit is due. Now, how he did it doesn't matter because it's been done. And my understanding of it isn't going to change how it was done. Okay? So the acknowledgement of who did it, that's what really matters. Okay? That's Genesis 1 and 2. Genesis 3 talks about the temptation of Adam and Eve and their fall. The ideal is lost, and they have to leave the Garden of Eden. Death and sin enter the world. Now, in Genesis 4, we find out that they have two sons. Cain is the older one, and Abel is the younger one. And that's where we're going to pick up. Genesis 4, 1 through 15. Adam made love to his wife. These flash, that's how babies are made. And Jesus became pregnant. I mean, I mean, sorry. And she, Jesus. And she became, I'm telling you guys, we're preaching this together, guys. Okay, come on, work with me here. Adam made love to his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. Abel is a shepherd, and Cain is a farmer, right? And they have their own things that they do. They both are meaningful work. We need both of them. To this day, we need shepherds and farmers. Because when we leave here, you want some meat to eat and some salad to go on top of it to make you feel better about it, right? That's what, when you leave here, that's what you're going to do. But we, we need those. So it's work that is worth doing. Verse 3, it says, In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. Now, firstborn, that means like before I knew which ones were the best ones? I just gave them the first ones, assuming those would be the best ones. Okay? That, that's not, you're sitting back and evaluating going, ooh, which, which dollars are not as ugly as the other? And I'll hand over those first, right? That's kind of, that's what he did. He said, no, I'm going to give you the first. That's what Abel did. They're both bringing sacrifices, and we all do this. We all make sacrifices in the terms of our time and money. We offer our talents to leverage our assets towards other things. We try to sacrifice the right things for the right reasons. That's basically your life. When you get a help coach or whatever you call them, self-help coach or, or cheerleader, I don't know what, they, what, what you exactly call them. All of them, they have different names. They do different things. But when you have one of those, they're essentially just going, this is wrong and this is right. Hey, stop doing the wrong and do the right. I should be a, I should be a coach. I should do this. I can, can I do this? Y'all, y'all can be my clients. Uh, so that's what it is. And at the right time, you try to make the right decisions. Why? So things will go well for us and we will prosper. Abel decides to give his first and best to God, views God as priority in his life. Cain makes a different sacrifice. He offers God his leftovers. He keeps his first and best for himself. So verse 4, the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So here it is. God is judging their sacrifices. You're like, well, how could you judge a sacrifice? That's a gift. You can judge a sacrifice. And if you are in a relationship, you judge each other's sacrifices. That's why you date. You try to figure out, are they willing to sacrifice in the way that I feel like sacrifices should be done? Are we on the same wavelength? It's why arguments start, and you go, well, I did this, but I do this, right? I do the cooking, but I do the laundry. You know, you're constantly comparing whose sacrifice is better. So according to God's judgment, Abel's sacrifice is favorable, and Cain's sacrifice is unfavorable. Even if you're not Christian, you might believe some sacrifices are more favorable than others. Verse 5, so Cain was very angry, and his face 
was downcast. But that is precisely what we do when we feel judged. Is that not what you do when you feel judged? You downcast. Like, oh, I don't feel so great about myself anymore. And I don't like that. And some of us, it can cause us to spiral into depression. Some of us towards anger. You go to these erratic emotions because you feel, you don't feel good about yourself anymore. We often feel shame and embarrassment when someone calls us out. We don't want to seem vulnerable because we're communicated, especially guys, communicated that vulnerability is weakness. So don't be vulnerable. Don't let anybody in. Be a brick wall. We're saying this to people that are not at war or anything like that, which is not a good combination. The shame and embarrassment often pre uh, present as re uh, resentment. So Cain is angry, and God says to him, he sees the anger. He says, uh, verse 6, Then the Lord said to Cain, why are, you, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you, don't, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. So God's response is sort of like, duh, what did you think was going to happen? I made all this, and I put it in, put this in the, the, the spit, the earth spinning, and the, and the plant. How do you think the plants get there? You think you grow those? You're just planting seeds. I'm the one that makes the magic happen. I'm the one that makes them come out of the ground. How do you think, what do you think was going to happen? You think I wasn't going to notice? I'm God. I see everything. If you make the right sacrifices, then things will go favorably for you. But if you don't, you invite sin at your doorstep because you're essentially separating, saying, I know better than God. What did we say sin was? Anything that harms you or others. The moment that you think that you know better than the Creator, you're, you are setting yourself on a path of destruction because you have now let go of the safety net or whatever it is, the handlebars, you're riding a bike without handlebars. And now you're just subject to whatever is in front of your circumstances because you have now excluded the one who can actually control and do it all. So that's where we end up. So you're inviting sin, some, anything that can hurt you or others, into your life. And it will catch up to you. It's important to note that Cain's not just angry with God, the sacrifice of his brother is judging him. It's making him feel his able sacrifice was the ideal, and that's what God communicated. He said, no, this is favorable, right? So whether you believe these are two real people or not, it doesn't really matter. Let me say this to you. Um, Samson, Moses, all of them, just because you say, decide, I don't believe that they're real, doesn't make them not real or real. You saying you believe that they're real doesn't make them more real than what they, how they really were. We, we, we have this idea that we can control the information and then make it work to our, to our own. Because did Moses know that you were going to exist? No. Does that make you any less real? No. So it's not about are they real or not. It's about seeing the story. It's about getting the, the ideal from it and going, how does this work in my life? How does this apply? It's a very full of wisdom story. So it's important to, to know that. He's not, he's, it's not about them specifically. It's about the, the information, about the wisdom in it. So, but the story is exactly right. It is the human, the human experience confirms it. When your friends talk about how great that one friend is, and they are, you're not the ideal. How does that make you feel? If you've ever been on any kind of sports team and the coach is constantly praising this one person, even though you made some good plays, but they're just praising and praising, what does that make you feel like? It's all right. That you don't measure up to the ideal. That you're, you're, not, you're, not, you're not what they want. When your boss highlights how competent your coworker is, and they are, it doesn't make you feel good. It makes you simultaneously feel insufficient, incompetent, or just how lame you are. Either way, you feel judged, which doesn't feel good, and so you go downcast. So you have two options when that happens. You can be inspired, do your very best to stretch towards whatever the ideal is, or you can do what Cain does. 
Verse 8. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While, they're, while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? That's where that came from. Have you ever said that setting, I'm not my brother's keeper? It came from right here. Uh, it's been around for a long time. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? What have you done? Again, he's God. If he can tell that you gave not your best, he can tell who killed Abel. He can tell. He says, what have you done? The what have you done implies you've done something wrong. There is an ideal. Instead of choosing to make a more favorable sacrifice, which was an option for Cain, instead he attacks and eliminates the ideal. He tries to remove it. He's like, if I can't live up to that, nor do I want to live up to that, instead of of just going about my business or trying, I'm going to take it away so then I become the ideal. There's nothing to compete with. I'm going to eliminate the competition, that ideal. And so that's what he does. He destroys the judge because he resents it. We all do this. Maybe not murder, hopefully not murder, okay? But when someone is more of an ideal or whatever than we are, we do our best to discredit or eliminate the judge. Case in point. Here's a quick story. Wow! Tina's husband is so thoughtful. Too bad he's ugly, doesn't seem to earn much, and he's a lousy golfer. Have you seen the ugly car he bought for her? You ever done that? I have. Okay. (laughs) I'll admit it. I'll be real with you guys. I have. Especially other church planners that get all what they want. and I I judge them hard, and I deal with it, guys. I am. (laughs) Don't judge me, okay? Only God can judge me. See what I did there? (laughs) Ah! But it, it's, it's natural. Don't be mad at yourself. It's, it's sinful nature. That's how, that's how we operate. Now, don't act on it. Now, that, that's where the problem comes in. You can check yourself and go, obviously, I'm not living up to something, and that's, they have something I want, or it makes me not feel good about myself. Here, here is a good key. If you're constantly feeling bad about yourself, delete social media. <laughs> delete it. If you're constantly looking down on yourself, I'm not measuring up, I'm not good as, I wish I had, chances are good. It's because of Instagram and the highlight reels. If that's all they, it's all highlight reels. Rarely does anybody really share what's going on in their life on Instagram. Rarely. They only show you the good stuff. So then all you think is their life is perfect and it's good and I am no good. That's what you think. So delete it. Do yourself a favor. Do, do away with it. Okay. It's easier to destroy and tear down the ideal than rise to it. Or the thing we're being judged against, then like we don't want to pursue it. It's rather just to take it away. Most people don't know what happens next in, in Scripture. I hope some of you do. The second part of the story is the most important part. Okay, verse 10, it says, Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. How haunting of a, of a sentence is that? Your brother's blood that you spilt is calling out to me. Wow. It'll give you nightmares, haunt you. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. Remember, he's the one that makes the magic happen. You will be re- a restless wanderer on the earth. And I'm thinking, that's it? He murdered his brother and he just loses his job? He couldn't do more to him? He couldn't make him suffer? Why are you letting him go? It seems like Cain is getting away with this. He killed his brother and God's just eliminating his job? I don't know, y'all with me on that? I, I, don't, I, I think that's crazy. Verse 13, Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be rest, a restless wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. 
okay, maybe God is smarter than us, okay? Maybe he knows what he's doing and justice will be served. Because in this time, you commit a crime, right? You do something. God essentially took away his ability to do something. Now he, he, he can't do anything for himself. Now he, he's dependent on other people, which is really ruining the rest. So verse 15, it says, But the Lord said to him, Not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. Why would God do that? The best understanding is it's an act of God's grace. It's the same grace that he has for us, that when you mess up, you sin, you're selfish, that he doesn't just take you out, that he lets you keep going. Now, there's consequences. There's consequences to our actions, but he's not going to kill you for said thing. It's for Cain, but even more, catch this, it's for Abel's family. They would be tempted to seek retribution. They would want justice. They would want judgment. Murder provokes revenge and the desire to avenge, and usually an eye for an eye. You killed him, I'm going to kill you. I understand that, that sentiment. I think we all can. Abel's descendants would be tempted to avenge his death. The tolerance for retribution destroys societies. Playing judge and taking justice into their own hands, Abel's family would become like Cain. The role of being the, the just judge is too much for anyone to bear. Anybody that wants to cast judgment says, that's not right. They shouldn't do that. I'm like, whoa, hold your horses there. That's more of a, of a responsibility than you can really handle. Only God can handle that. Only him. It's the reason why we have juries in our court system that we, we are almost less than adequate, really, of being judge and jury. Have you ever heard a jury story? It's almost a joke. It's almost comedic now. Like you go, and I have no idea what they're talking about, but I'm in it for the show. You know what I mean? It's like, what are we doing? We don't really take this as seriously as hope, but then some take it too seriously. We're not designed for it. We do not do a good job of judging anyways. Have you ever prejudged or misjudged someone or a situation unjustly? I do it all the time. Anytime my boys are fighting, I always assume it's the other one. They're like, well, if you did that, then they're like, well, that's not actually what happened. And they're like, oh, gosh, I'm not even worthy to be your parents to, judge, to be able to judge this, right? I can't do this. We do it all the time. We're often quick to judge, and we do so incorrectly. So God puts an end to this right away. Despite Cain's appalling crime, no one's allowed to seek retribution against Cain or else. On brand, Cain later decides to act as if he is God, same as the original sin. He will avenge his children 70 times, grandchildren 77 times. It all spirals from there. Generations later, Tubal Cain is one of his descendants, um, is credited for creating weapons of war. That's what it says That's what's in history. What's the next thing that happens in Scripture? Anybody know? Any good Old Testament Bible thumpers out there? Hmm? The next thing that happens is the flood. They create weapons of war. It gets out of control. And God says, erase. <laughs> the flood comes. Now, it makes a little more sense, right, of why he did what he did. Humanity's on the brink of destruction because of selfishness and greed, wanting to take the ideal away so we don't get judged. And he's like, I'm going to clean the slate. It's the flood. There's no coincidence that. It's the archetype, archetype of everything that happens after the fall of Adam and Eve. The ideal is lost, and the things are not right in the world anymore. There are two paths to follow in life. You can choose to live one way that's favorable or the other way that's not. And here's a side note from a psychological, uh, philosophical perspective. These are brilliant stories describing the human condition and how we operate. Brilliant stories. It's a meta-narrative for human history and how we should live or how we should not live. And Jesus came to show us that. He said, follow me and I will show you how to live. So I'll close up with this. So in the first week, 
We said travel light. We said, number one, Jesus is God's son and our king. He is our reference point. He's God's final king. Jesus gets the final say, all of that. In John 22, it says, moreover, the father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to his son. He is the one that judges. He is the one that holds that power. When we think of final judgment, it's only a relation to going to heaven or hell, but it's exactly how all things are made right in the end. Number, number, uh, then we jump to number four, and this is what really kind of helps in what we've talked about today. As God's final king and judge, Jesus promised justice in the end, and he invites us to trust him in the meantime. That's number four of travel light. Jesus promised justice in the end and invites us to trust him in the meantime because justice will be served and all will be made right. In the meantime, Jesus asks, will you trust me? Will you trust me? Will you trust Jesus how to live your life? Jesus invites us to follow him and live in the best way possible. We're to live in the light of the promise. And that's why I say, even if you're not a believer, if you just follow his teachings, it will be a catalyst in your life. Now, I don't think you're getting the full picture if you're also not a follower, but you are by design. Whether you believe in God or not, you're designed. And if you operate within that design, things are going to go favorably your way. People have found this out. There's atheists out there who are very generous, and they're getting the positives of generosity, but they would get so much more if they followed Jesus, the one who created, the one who showed us how to be generous, because that's how it works. But we've also brought hell into our lives by choices we've made, or those made by the people in our lives. You know this. You've seen it, and some of you have experienced trusting Jesus to be the final judge can bring ultimate justice, but it's in choosing to follow the way he taught us to live. So he taught us, and it makes way more sense now what sin is defined to be and what judgment is and who holds judgment. He taught us to know evil for evil, love your enemies, turn the other cheek, Pray for your prosecutors, be generous, put others first, go the extra mile, and live a life that's purposeful and matters. It makes way more sense now. So trusting God to bring justice to all situations is not doing nothing. There are many things he told us about in our lives, yet the Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for good or evil we have done in this earthly body. This isn't to terrify or torment, but to encourage us to provide hope. If you have ever thought, Jesus doesn't want anything to do with me because you don't know what I've done. He knows exactly what you've done. He knows. But as long as you have breath in your lungs, you have an opportunity of hope. You can turn things around at any moment. That's what a life coach is. Just stop it. The thing that's hurting you, stop. As soon as you stop the thing that's hurting you, what sin? Anything that hurts you or other? Any time you stop doing that, you begin to feel better. It might not be an immediate because you've built your life around it, but making that change, you will ultimately end up in a better place. We all give an account. We all sacrifice, prioritize to follow Jesus. You will see a difference in your life. They will all, everybody, will give an account, and so will I. And it's not my place to judge despite how much it matters to us. It, we will not be rewarded. And this is one of the things. I don't know why Christians think this or who told them this, this is the way it goes down. We think that the better we judge, the more favorable we are to God. It is not, we don't gain anything from judging well, judging others. We don't gain anything from that. God's not like, oh, oh you, you know what I want, right? He's not like that. That's not the way it happens. If you are having, it's, humans can be predictable, right? Especially if you know that they're selfish, because usually they're going to do something that's in their direction. That doesn't make God any more happy with me. What makes God happy and draws me closer to him is me saying, you are the one who controls it all, and I'm going to try to live in the design. 
more favorable circumstances when you do that. So as a result of what God has done, God's final, he's the final king who has the final say, who showed up at the first time. As a result of his mercy and grace, he has delayed his final judgment, which he, God could do at any moment. But because of what he's done and what he's set in place, and that's how powerful and awesome that what Jesus did for us, he's delayed the judgment and given humanity the opportunity to live in a favorable way to sacrifice in a favorable way that draws us closer to God. He provided an opportunity for all of us not lived outside of the design to bring back into the design, to trust in his sacrifice, to accept God's judgment on our behalf. He called himself the good shepherd. He came to lay his life down for his sheep. And by doing so, he earned the right to be trusted. Which is why we have, number four, Jesus promised justice in the end and invites us to trust him in the meantime. So anything that you have in your heart against somebody else right now, somebody that has wronged you, even if it's, you could take legal action. I mean, do whatever you got to do. Pray to God about it. Do whatever. I can't make that decision for you. But rest assured knowing that's not your burden. God didn't ask you to judge. He didn't ask you to make that call. That's his call. And he's saying, I've done that for you. I'm doing that for you. Just trust me. And if you can do that, things will begin to change. And do not miss next week or I'll judge you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much um, that we get to come together in your name and learn about you. Lord, this is confusing. It goes against our selfish nature. We want to be God. We want to be, have control like you, but truthfully, we can't handle that control. We think that we can. We see the perks of it, but truthfully, we can't handle it. We are never been equipped, never will be equipped enough to be able to handle that burden. That's only for you. So Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming down and doing the ultimate thing, to take on that role for us, to give humanity another chance to draw closer back to its creator. So help us individually do that. Help us in our own lives navigate, make the right sacrifices at the right time to try to meet the ideal, to put ourselves in a more favorable circumstance and stop worrying about everybody else's everybody else's judgment. Help us to do that. And Lord, as we carry this forth, as we begin to work on ourselves, Lord, I pray that we have the courage and the vulnerability to invite people along with us, to help them learn what judgment really is, and help them see who you really are, and that it's not just a distant God, but one that really loves us so much so that he sent his only son to die for us so that we could delay that judgment. Thank you for all these things. Bless these people as we go. Bless Village Heights. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.